Hey, what's up, Scott Balkam here with Imagination Creation Films, and today we're doing a full review of the Panasonic EVA-1. There are a ton of cameras on the market today trying to capture your eye. They're dazzling you with a variety of features and gimmicks that lure you into believing you're getting the ultimate camera for your money. Sadly, many of these cameras don't live up to the simple basic requirements of a camera to easily produce a quality and useful image with limited hassle at a reasonable price. Now, when the Panasonic EVA-1 was introduced almost two years ago, I was quite interested in this camera. It seemed to check a lot of boxes for a simple all-in-one camera. Now, I was recently given the opportunity to get my hands on an evaluation copy to put it through its paces. Now, this review is everything that I've discovered in my few weeks of using it, which I have done extensively. There is good and there is bad. Let's start with the good. But before we do, I want to ask you to take a moment to go ahead and click subscribe to this channel. We're a growing group of filmmakers just like yourself, and we think you'd be a great part. So please click subscribe, also the alert bell. So the specs of this camera are pretty amazing. 14 stops of dynamic range, 5.7K, Super 35 sensor, dual native ISO, onboard scratch audio, onboard shotgun mic, dual powered XLR inputs, onboard ND filters, dual high speed SD cards, slots, SDI, HDMI, long battery life, lightweight, ergonomic design, EF lens mount, and onboard 10-bit recording. Oh, and high frame rates, time code, electronic image stabilization, et cetera, et cetera. You get it. That's a lot, it really is. So what does the camera do well? Well, it's fairly light and compact, packing a lot of power into a somewhat ergonomic package. Now the image out of the camera is quite nice. It feels very much like a GH5S or one of the Vericam models. Now it has a little more dynamic range than GH5 and it shoots full V-Log instead of the V-Log light. Now this really comes out in the highlights where the GH5 would clip everything over 82 IRE, the AVA-1 doesn't do it at all. It's comfortable shooting all the way up to 100 IRE. Now noise-wise, the EVA-1 just does quite well. At native 800 ISO, it produces a very nice image when you have plenty of light. At native ISO 2500, it produces an extremely clean image in much lower lighting scenarios. Now, I was using this camera in a variety of situations, in the studio, inside locations, and outdoors. And the camera did everything that I asked of it. It ended up shooting most of everything in UHD 10-bit V-Log. I found that it produced the nicest image overall. Now, when I say the image has a very cam look to it, well, what I mean is it has kind of that gray cyan tint overall. It's, it's hard to describe, but once you see a Panasonic image, you can always see it. It's very much like Sony and their sensors before the recent changes in the color science, that is. It is very pleasing to the eye and able to be shaped in many ways that you might need to push the color. Now, it doesn't really produce a solid stock film look. It does have a little Panasonic character in it. And, and the Rec. 709 looks nice, but does have that gray cyan look to it. Now, many of you may see different colors in Panasonic than I do, and I'll admit I do have some color blindness. I did say some. I can kind of actually kind of pick my way through it, but I found the shooting options to be almost identical to the GH5S. Same bit rates, codecs, and color depth as well. It was very familiar to me and easy to expose and get the shot. Now, there's a built-in waveform monitor, focus assist, and punch-in ability to nail focus. More on those later. The built-in ND is lovely, offering an ND2, ND4, and an ND6, and it covers all the bases. And it honestly had a pleasing look to them as well, and we all know that some, if not many, NDs can color the footage quite differently, and these don't seem to do that at all. This evaluation unit that I had came with a Zacuto monitor mount that allowed it to be more flexible in its position, as well as Zacuto's viewfinder, though we'll talk about more on that later. Now, the design is very Canon-esque, with a removable side handle and a removable top handle. That allows you to convert the camera into also Canon-esque potato cam format. Now, the batteries lasted about two and a half hours each, which was pretty amazing for a camera this size. Three batteries lasted me all day shooting, and shooting we were. This camera was being used 10 hours a day for days straight on a job, and it was the perfect job to test it out as well, because it had very 
various lighting conditions throughout the day with indoor shots as well. Constantly changing lighting, constantly changing atmosphere, the sun, the sky, clouds, mist, haze. I was shooting with both the RED and the EV1 that day, and uh, there's plenty of footage to compare. Now, the camera doesn't weigh that much. In fact, it feels a little too light sometimes, and that's where the electronic image stabilization comes in. Now, it works fairly well, but don't push it too hard. You'll find some little warps and such that will sneak in, but it does a pretty good job of smoothing out all the little details. Now, let's spend a minute on the negatives. Now, there are quite a few. None of these are showstoppers, but they can sure get your feathers in a ruffle at times. That's a weird phrase. I'd never really understood that one. First, the monitor. The monitor on board is a one megapixel, and the camera sensor is 17 megapixels. Pulling focus can truly be a nightmare on the screen, even with the punching ability and the focus assist. It can be a pain in the rear. The monitor is also very dim, almost unusable outside in the bright sunlight. Now, it does come with a lens hood, and it's quite cool. It pops out when you need it and closes to protect the screen when you don't. But still doesn't let it be used in the sun. There is no viewfinder either. The evaluation unit they supplied a Zacuto viewfinder, which is an attachment that magnifies the screen. And it does make it easier to focus and use it in the bright daytime. But the Zacuto weighs a ton, and it is far more than the screen swivel can handle. It'll just fall off if a mouse farts in a hole a mile away. I do realize that this isn't a Panasonic issue as they didn't make the viewfinder attachment, but I imagine they'll keep this in mind for the future. Also, on the screen, the display for the needed information is so tiny, it is almost unusable. Now, the record indicator is a little red dot buried right between two other pieces of information. It's so small, you end up looking two to three times to verify it's even recording. Oh, and the monitor is touchscreen. Although I would likely call it a touch screen, as you really have to press on it to get it to respond. Now, did it inhibit my ability to shoot? No, not really. They're, they're, none of these issues really stopped me. They, they slowed me down a few times, but never halted my ability to use the camera in, in a usable way. Now, I would want a good, solid external monitor for this camera. Also, when shooting in ISO 3200 using the base ISO of 2500, the onboard monitor made it made the image appear very, very noisy. I was a little concerned that I may have just completely blown those shots, but it was all the light I had. And, and when I got home and reviewed the files, I was surprised. There was no noise at all in the videos. I didn't have any noise reduction turned on either. I don't like that. It was very, very clean image. Now, I have no idea why the monitor looked like it did, but whoa. Next up, the side handle. Now, this was designed for tiny hands, and if you're hand holding it for more than three to four minutes, cramps are gonna start to develop, and unless you have the tiniest of hands, gosh, this would be a cool time to get some tiny hands. You know, those little tiny hands that you can just, you know, it does, yeah, you know, but you can rotate that handle, and it does help a little bit, but still, after a few minutes, uh, you might wanna change the way you hold the camera altogether. It can get, a little uncomfortable. Now the controls are a bit all over the place. There are buttons for almost everything, but they aren't exactly laid out intuitively. Now, granted, I only had a few weeks with this camera, so over time, I'm sure I would gain some muscle memory, but overall, I felt the buttons to be a little more confusing than required. And now there is a wheel and a few buttons on the side handle. Now the wheel has a mind of its own, sometimes giving you more of what you wanted and sometimes less. Now the codex. Now, it's not fair for me to complain about the codex because, well, I knew what they were before I received the camera. But this is a camera in a higher price point, geared more towards the professional, and yet you can't record 5.7K internally, even at 8 bit. Now, there's a codex that has a 400 megabit rate inside and one with a 150 megabit rate. I would think they could squeeze the 5.7K into at least the 400 megabit rate even if they had to go 8-bit. And you can record it external, which is nice. I didn't have an external recorder to test, but raw is raw. Now, for the most part, this is raw, but this is also 10-bit raw, which is a bit of a head-scratcher here. I'm not really sure what 
that means. But next up is the file structure. The way the camera records to the SD cards is unnecessarily confusing. It buries the video files way down in a directory structure that's not unique. I wish camera manufacturers would follow suit with many of the others, Blackmagic, Red, Airy, etc., and create unique folders and files for each mag card for each shot. Now, the menus, these like the buttons are all over the place. With the GH5, I was able to figure out where most everything was. With the EVA1, I'm still searching the menus every time, like the format. Usually that would be in a utility or file menu. Nope, it's in the record settings. Want to playback? There isn't a playback menu. It's a button called thumbnails. Uh, okay. Under the file menu, though, uh, you know, where you expect to see format. No, you get to scene files. Um, these are cool because you can save presets to the camera, but under file? <sighs> With the electronic image stabilization, Although I can't 100% confirm, but I believe it is EIS that's causing this, I'd get an invalid message on the screen. A lot. And it usually happened when I was changing settings, but it would be nice to know what caused it and how to prevent it. Now, I googled and ran into almost nothing posted about it. No idea. Uh, that's enough about the negatives. Like I said, they weren't showstoppers, just head scratchers. And sometimes you just want to bang your head on the desk. But again, with more time, I bet I'd get used to everything and avoid most of these issues altogether. And I like to be very fair and 100% honest with my reviews. And well, I hope that you've come to expect that of me. I give it to you straight. So what is the straight on this camera? Well, I like it. I really do. It did so many things better than the GH5, and it just flat out did what I needed. It looks great. It felt great, well, mostly. It operated very well, mostly. It was frugal on the batteries and media. It was versatile and flexible, adapting to almost every situation that I put it through. It performed great in low light. It performed great in bright sunlight. Thank you, internal ND. And even on cloudy days, it had a nice image. Now, I know many of you are asking, is this camera worth it in 2020 when the camera is almost two years old? My answer is, well, yes. And the reasons are many. But honestly, when this camera came out, it was ahead of its time. So it's just now matching the peak of the industry. And this is a great camera for so many purposes. I can honestly say that I thought I would love this camera going in and my suspicions weren't changed that much at all. This is a solid camera and kind of a heck of a value. Match it with a good external recorder with a monitor, of course, and uh, so many problems disappear. And you're gonna get 5.7K raw. You know, like all those new cameras that are just starting to come out now. I think the EVA-1 has been somewhat slow seller for one reason only, that very few people know about it. You should know about it, and you should consider it. Now, what do you think about the EVA-1? Leave a comment down below with your opinions, comments, etc. As always, please be nice. I run a clean channel, and I welcome all viewpoints, but keep your tone and your language to a respectable level. If you love this camera, put it down below. If you dislike this camera, put it down below. If you use this camera all the time, put it down below. Let's talk about it. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below as well. I try to read and respond to each and every one, even if it's just to say thank you. Uh, remember to subscribe and click the alert bell. Give me a thumbs up if you like it. If you didn't, give me a thumbs down. We can still be friends. You can support me in many ways, PayPal, Patreon, Amazon links down below. I appreciate each and every one of you. And as always, as I like to leave it, don't let your passions center around your life. Let your life center around your passions. And the reasons are many, but honestly, when this camera came out, is there a wasp in here? Hi.